tell. I certainly wouldn't like to be a judge because as of this moment, every provincial judge in British Columbia stands smeared with the nameless accusation that one of them consorted with the prostitute in what must on the very face of it be an improper action for a judge. And I have every reason to believe, or to fear might be a better word, that the Judicial Council of British Columbia, which will handle this allegation, may well decide to hold their hearing in secret. Now why do I say that? This morning I questioned Chief Judge Larry Goulet of the provincial bench in British Columbia, and he refused to tell me when and where the hearing will take place. He would only say that it will be in the city of Vancouver soon. I believe the hearing will be sometime on Friday. Mr. Goulet did tell me that at the start of the proceedings, the Judicial Council in all its glory will decide whether it be a public or a private hearing. Now, they will then have to adjourn if they decide it's going to be a public hearing to let the public know when and where it will be. Now, all this came about, a little background, because a hotel employee sent to Mr. Goulet an affidavit alleging that he had seen Judge X getting into a car with a known prostitute outside the Devonshire Hotel. If that is true, or if that were true, would that be bad? Well, take it from me, it most certainly would be, because judges in this city deal on a daily basis with prostitutes and the allied crimes of drugs. And uh, there, of course, must be no familiarity whatsoever between judges and suspected criminals. There was a notorious case in BC a few years ago involving a judge, a provincial judge, in which the judge was tried in secret. And the reason that trial was in secret was because the act at that time controlling judges was so sloppily written that the defense counsel for the accused judge could not subpoena witnesses. They held that hearing in secret. They didn't really have much option. And the judge, by the way, was uh, forced to resign. Since then, the act has been amended, and there is full and complete provision for the hearings to be held in public. Last year, just by the way, the inquiry into the conduct of the indiscreet remarks by Provincial Judge Les Bewley was held in public. That was held in public because of the very common sense insistence of Mr. Bewley himself. You know, to be quite serious, as I have been all through this, it cannot be left to judges or the Judicial Council to decide that this hearing is to be in public. In Ontario, all such inquiries are in public. And if there is one section of our system of law which must be above all suspicion, but must, when it is under suspicion, be under the closest public scrutiny, it is the judge himself. In this particular case, it was Associate Chief Judge uh, Alfie Watts who made the preliminary investigation on the hotel man's uh, allegations and recommended the official inquiry. There is, of course, a very simple way to solve any problem there might be about whether the hearing will be in public or in private. In the act now, the cabinet has the right, if not the duty, I think it's the duty, to order the inquiry to be held in public. The Attorney General's Department is once again sitting on its hands. Mr. Gardner, where are you when you're needed to do the things that require uh, the proper action so that the system of law and justice can be properly respected? One, of course, must have sympathy with the judge should the allegation be found to be unsubstantiated or be false. But the system of justice is much more important than the embarrassment to any single judge. All I can tell you now, having checked with Chief Judge Larry Goulet, is that there is going to be a secret meeting, my description, he would tell you an in-camera meeting in private, a secret meeting of the Judicial Council somewhere in the city of Vancouver on Friday. Maybe the Judicial Council members, an august body, should turn up with paper bags over their heads so people don't know who they are or where they're going. But I would strongly recommend to Premier Bennett and to the Cabinet and Mr. Gardner that they don't mess about with this. Let's not leave it to the Judicial Council to decide if it's going to be public or private. The Cabinet should order this as a public inquiry today.
At the Socialist International Congress, we're going to meet a man who has been a member for many years of what is regarded, widely regarded as the best private club in the world, the House of Commons in Westminster, Ian McCardo, MP for Bethnal Green and Bow. Hyphen Bow. B and Bow. Uh, Bethnal Green and Bow. Bow yeah. That makes you, Mr. McCardo, a distinguished member of the British Labour Party, a 100% legitimate Cockney. Well, no, I represent a Cockney constituency, of course, um, and I'm a Cockney in the sense that I've lived in it and around it and very, or very near to it ever since I was a boy. But in fact, I wasn't born in it. I was born in the city of Portsmouth. And one of the reasons I feel so much at home in Vancouver is that anybody who's ever been born in a big port is always at home in a big port anywhere else in the world. And that day you were born couldn't have been any more than 55, 56 years well, ago. Well, it was exactly 70 years ago. 70 years ago. Yeah, no. But pick, oh, up, yeah. pick up my crack about the, the best private club in the world. Oh, well, it used to be, of course. It had the reputation of being the best private club in the world when the average attendance in the House of Commons was somewhere between 80 and 120 people every day out of the 600 and odd members. It's not the best private club anymore. It's not a very good club at all because it is now hideously overcrowded and the facilities are inadequate because we now get something between 350 and 550 members in this, this accommodation every day. There are only 58 seats in the smoking room. Oh, and there are only 71 seats in the library. Oh. So the uh, we're no longer the best club. It's much too overcrowded. To be I remember the decor when I used to go with my brother and stand in your little bar. And you describe that decor for me, please. Oh, well, in the, that, in the days you're talking about, that bar was a lovely old bar. First of all, it was nice and big. And it was the sort of place where, if you felt like it, you could spit on the floor and the rest of it. It was tiled in all oh, strange green tiles. It was an almost identical copy of the men's lavatory in Ashton Underline Railway Station. Now we've gone all respectable, you see. They've altered it, they've taken a bit away, and they've panelled it, and they've put in air conditioning. And it ain't the old place anymore. I don't feel as much at home in it as I used to. Well, now, maybe that's the trouble with social democracy throughout the world. Here you are in the most beautiful city in North America. Where are you? You're in a lush, highly expensive, the, one of the best hotels in Canada, the Hyatt Regency. Is this not the wrong place for a social democratic convention? Oh, no, look, this is a view which I don't take. Uh, this is a view of, this is the old strength through misery view, and I don't go along with that. I, it is no part of my socialist philosophy to leave all the good material things in life to the Conservatives. By no means. Uh, I want to see a situation in which the sort of standards in which I can enjoy are enjoyed by everybody and are available to everybody. It'll take a long time coming. But I certainly don't take the view that only those of the right are entitled to the good things of life. But if the workers don't work, who the hell's going to make the money for the country? I mean, if the workers get the idea that they're entitled to the good things of life, uh, suddenly the dollar drops, your export production falls, and people say, my God, these people won't work. If people... They've got too many good things. Uh, it, it, having good things is an incentive to work more. You know, the conservative attitude I am deliberately reflecting at yes, the moment. Yes, I know. And it's all fairy tales. The people who talk about workers don't work are generally people who've never worked a, a stroke of work in their lives. Mm -hmm. And the plain fact, of course, if people don't work, if there are no producers, there ain't going to be any consumers. That's mm -hmm. a, uh, that is one of the self-evident facts of life. But I don't see what the hell's that got to do with where the Socialist International should take its Congress. Well, let's get to the Socialist International and its Congress. Yeah. And a little bit of background on none other than Ian McCardo. Yeah. I remember well Ian McCardo, R.H. Crossman, one of the foot boys. Michael Foot? Michael, yeah. And you were the boys who were the, the ginger group to keep the Socialist Party, the Labour Party of Britain, on the left-hand rail. Where did you fail? We didn't fail. What do you mean you didn't we fail? We didn't fail. We just happened to be a minority. You have to bear in mind that the Labour Party is not a socialist party. The Labour Party is a party of social reform which contains a minority of socialists. Where do you stand on that? Oh, I'm, I'm still the same old left place that I always was. 
and I'll never be any different. For I'm not going to be in public life much longer, but for as long as I'm there, I haven't moved an inch, and I hope you're not suggesting I have moved. No. And nobody who knows me would suggest for a moment that I've moved. On the whole, I think we've done well, far from failing. In the 50 years nearly since I've been a member of the Labour Party, that socialist minority within the Labour Party has increased very considerably in number. It's increased very much in influence. And to the extent that it can carry most of the resolutions that it wants at a Labour Party conference, to the extent that it is now a majority on the National Executive Committee of the Labour Party. But they don't. But, but when you get into the parliamentary leadership, that's a different cup of tea. Right. That's a different cup of tea. And, of course, that's where the major part of the decision-making process is, is a, goes on. Our endemic problem as a Labour Party has been there ever since there's been a Labour Party, and that is the gap between the parliamentary party and the party as a whole. Am I right? Of course, we're not alone in that. that. That goes for very many democratic socialist parties and social democratic parties. In other words, the party convention or the party itself says, we want to nationalise, socialise this and that. And the party leader, be it Callaghan or Dave Barrett or anybody else, says, no, just a moment. That's going too far. We might lose our power if we go I that don't far. know. Well, I wouldn't know about Dave Barrett. Well, Callaghan. But certainly, if you're talking about the leaders of our party, uh, what happens, and it's, uh, I repeat, it happens in very many other parties, uh, is that they are very much more militant when they're in opposition than they are when they're in government. And, of course, this doesn't apply only to Labour parties. It applies to Conservative parties as well. The Conservative Party in Great Britain, for example, the one I know best, is much more right-wing in opposition than it, than it is in government. When parties get into government, they tend to move towards the centre of the political scene. Just as well, isn't it? No, I don't think it's just as well. Because I, I don't think it's just as well for two reasons. One is that the centre of the political spectrum hasn't got any solutions to the major problems of the day. And you can see the evidence of that all around the world today, in slump and large-scale unemployment and raging inflation, the enormous and growing gap between the rich nations and the poor nations, the continuation of the arms race. They haven't found any solutions, are they? They haven't made a good world. And uh, that, that's one reason why the centre of the political spectrum is not for the best. The other reason is that it's in a way, a threat to democracy. Now, you know Britain well because you were in the thick of things before you came to Canada. And you know that what the ordinary Britain likes is a choice, a clear choice between two ways. If he goes to a football match, he's either shouting for the home team or he's shouting for the away team. He never shouts for a draw. <laughs> Correct. And he's never shouting in favour of the referee. That's for a certainty. Correct. He wants a clear choice. The more parties move to try and capture each other's centre ground, to try and steal each other's clothes, the less well does the democratic system function. Mm -hmm. And the nearer you get to a threat of a dictatorship. Well, in this country, not to tell you something you don't know, all we have in power is either Tweedledum or Tweedledee. Uh, that's right. And in the United States, of course. Tweedle, why, why do you think... Because there is no ideological differences there between the... Would you care to offer to me a thought uh, as to why you think we do not have a powerful m social democratic movement in Canada on the national scene? Oh, because you're fairly new and you're fairly new to politics. After all, we've been, we've been at the parliamentary system for more than seven centuries and we've only had any a powerful left-wing party Since. for 60-odd years. Mm -hmm. You'll come round to it, I've no doubt at all. <laughs> now, specific... What's more, I get the impression, I mean, I'm not an authority on Canadian politics, and I wouldn't pretend to know more than I know, which is very little, but I, I get the impression that you're on the way to it. It'll take a bit of time, but you're on the way to it. I think people, in the end, will get browned off with his tweedledum tweedledum. Are you suggesting to me, Ian McCardo, a man of a wealth of political experience, that what Canadians want is the kind of dead hand of an egalitarian, bureaucratized social democracy where all things are equal and everybody gets everything from the cradle to the grave without that necessary free enterprise survival process? Now that's sticking up an Aunt Sally in order to knock it down. I do not believe there is any party outside the communist bloc which believes in this egal total egalitarian, and everybody gets everything quite a little grey, bureaucratic, la-di-da-di-da-di-da. -da -da -da. I will tell you something. 
I have been, in addition to being a politician, until I retired a year or two back, a management consultant for 40 years, and a very, very successful one. You mean on the bossy side? Yeah, that's right. Then companies who hated my political beliefs were happy to employ me to advise them about certain... Well, 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 well take it easy. You, you don't get so excited. You can come, come back in a minute. And I'll tell you this. I know a bit about how it all works, the present system works. There is nothing more bureaucratic than the large-scale privately owned company, and especially the multinational company. They make a government department look silly in the depths of their bureaucracy. I remember once, the first time I was a candidate in the election, I was working in a company and a chap, the managing director of it was an ex-brigadier in the army. It was 1945, that was the first election. And he said to me, I said, I'm not going to be here for the next three weeks, I'm going off to fight in the election. He said to me, you know, um, I could almost be tempted for the first time in my life to vote Labour. But he said, I'm put off by one thing. And that is the amount of bureaucracy that is represented by government intervention in business. I said, really? How come? He said, well, you know, any, any time you want anything, you have to fill up a form and trip to get and la di da no. So I said to him, what happens in this company if somebody in the company wants to buy something? He said, I'm blowed if I know. So I said, well, flick your phone and find out. So he flicked your phone, his phone and got through to the purchasing department. And he said, well, we want to buy something, what happens? The chap said, well, if it's less than 10 shillings, that's a currency we've lost now, half, a, half an English pound, one dollar in the news, no matter. If it's less than 10 shillings, we buy it out of petty cash. And if it's more than 10 shillings, we issue a purchase order. So I said, now ask him how many copies of his purchase order he makes. Answer, seven. <laughs> so he said, OK, son, you win. <laughs> hey, don't, I mean, don't blather to me about no, the no. democracy that is in Your charm is so incredible and your wit is superior. Incredible, and your wit is superior. The fact remains, though, that the privileged class in, in the welfare state seems to be the, what's the word, the incredible number of civil servants with their indexed pensions to the cost of living. Now, you've got this in Britain, too. A special class who finish government service with indexed pensions, while the poor blinking working man is lucky if he gets a pension. Oh, well, I go along with you. I go along with you in that. But what the hell has that got to do with social democracy? Well, what about the... the or democratic socialism, or anything? Well, have, you, have you got social democracy in Canada? No. A form of... Oh, come, come, come. We've got a democracy of well, a kind. You've got a democracy. But, you know, Canada is a typically buccaneering free enterprise state. And you've got your cushioned civil servants. Oh, yeah, thousands so, of them. Right, thousands. so don't make that an attribute of democratic socialism. Yeah, well, that's an attribute of the mandarins who control the, the, the politicians and feather their beds and increase their power and build their tents yeah, bigger and look, bigger. If I could induce you by some form of persuasion to be logical for a moment or two... I shall two, try. I'll do my best. You started by saying you can't have socialism because it then results in bureaucracy. Right. Now you confess you've got a feather-bedded bureaucracy in a country like Canada, which with all its virtues is as far away from socialism as one could conceivably get. So, come off it. And you have a point there, but the fact remains that, uh, that even under the so-called liberal government of the great Pierre Elliott Trudeau, that we have uh, a welfare state almost as great as yours in terms of benefits to people. They're now trying to cut back on it because they can't afford it anymore. But we have the welfare state. Is that not the basis of good social democracy? No. Cradle to the grave? No. It's not? No. Or is it the ownership of the means of production by the state for the benefit of the workers? No, neither. Both of those are elements in what socialism is about. Socialism is the creation of a just society in which people don't live by exploiting one another. That's Pierre and, Trudeau. And, well, 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 well. And it doesn't exist in Canada, and it don't exist anywhere in the world outside Kibbutzim in Israel. 
And it's no good chaps like you. It's media chaps are very fond of doing this, of putting labels on socialism and saying, look what's happened to socialism, it's failed and this, that, and that. It is true of socialism what somebody once said of Christianity. Not that it has been tried and found wanting, it's been found difficult and not tried. There is no example of democratic socialism anywhere in the world, you, outside of a couple of hundred little communities in Israel. There isn't one anywhere in the world. Give me that so, again. So, you know, what you have got to do, if you want to try and characterise socialism and put a label on it, is to do a bit of theoretical study, because you cannot get it from practical experience. There ain't none to draw. I want you to give me that again. Socialism is like Christianity. Give me that again. Your little analogy you used. What I said, somebody once said, what I said is it, it is true of socialism, what somebody once said of Christianity, not that it has been tried and found wanting, but that it has been found difficult and not tried. Good indeed. Well, I should regard that at my advanced stage as the beginning of my education. Well, that'll do. I'm glad, glad to hear it. I'm glad to hear it. You haven't, you haven't stopped learning. Now let's get down to some sharp snappers. Yes. Callahan. Yeah. Good job, bad job, and different job. Oh, a bit of them all. Good job in the sense that he undoubtedly carries public confidence. He looks it, doesn't he? Well, he looks Solid. it, and he sounds it, and people think of him as a sensible, feet-on-the-ground man, which indeed he is. Doesn't listen to the party, follows the public. Sometimes, well, he doesn't follow the public either. Um, he makes his own judgment. I know him a long time. We both went to the same school. We were both born in Portsmouth, and we both went to the same school. He, he came in three years after I did. I'm three years older than he is. Uh, so I've known him a very long time, and indeed, uh, when I was first selected as a candidate for Parliament in Reading in 1943, he was one of the chaps I defeated for the selection. Is that so? Yes. Is that so? Yes, indeed. And uh, we are a good deal apart politically, but we have a very considerable personal regard with, for each other, and we get on with it. Now, right now, he's faced with this bind. Uh, he's trying to hold 5% line on wage increases. Yeah. And I gather the TUC would like to cut his throat in that. Well, I mean, it's in the question of cutting his throat. Everybody knows it's not on. But you, he beat inflation for you. You had 25% inflation at one time, and now you're down to 7, I think it is. Uh, that's right. And you can, you can, and you use methods which can be used for a while and cannot be used indefinitely. But he overplayed his hand. He had three years of wage norms. They were different each year. Uh, there was a good deal of resentment. Then he sort of let success go to his head and chose a fourth year when everybody said in the third year we can't do a fourth. He should have let it go then. And then, no, not only did he choose a fourth year, he might have got away with it even though people had said it's not on, a fourth year's not on. But, drunk with his success, he produced a norm for the fourth year, half of what was the norm for the third year. Now that was really asking for trouble. You know? I'll bet you I This can... is like a guy who's, you know, he's had a success with getting a pretty girl to bed, so he decides to get two in the bed at once at the same time and comes unstuck, you know. This is I'll, a, I'll bet you I can name somebody you didn't go to school with. And just to finish, I want a capsule opinion of this person with whom you did not go to school. The woman with the twin sets and the pedal chokers. What's her name? Mrs. Thatcher you're talking about. Capsule comment on her. I think she would make a good number two minister in a less important government department in a bad year. <laughs> would you give your regards to my younger brother Drew should you see him in London? I would indeed, of course. Thanks. I will indeed. I will ask him whether he uh, still has the same great regard for you that he always had. <laughs> Thank you, Ian Mercado. You're welcome. Ian Mercado, MP Labour Party, for Bethnal hyphen, Bethnal Green Bow, a Bethnal Bow, a delightful man and some good sound wisdom in him too. For the balance of the program, we're going to look right or wrong at some candidates, school board candidates in Vancouver and school costs. For instance, 1970 in Vancouver, the costs were 
a mere 45 million dollars. In 79, they're going to be 120 million. And this at a time when the number of students is down 21 percent and the school costs over that decade up 246 percent. And let's take a specific look at the students. In 1970, 72,500. In 1979, 55,000. And the cost per student has gone from 628 bucks a year in 70 to 2,100 a year in 1979. How long can we afford this escalation? This morning I make my bow towards the school board elections throughout British Columbia. And the one we're going to look at particularly this morning, of course, is the city of Vancouver, which is often regarded as the most feather-bedded, although quite competent, school system in the province of British Columbia. So we're going to do it in three parts. We're going to have two people from NPA GEM, two people from dear old COPE, and two people from the establishment of TEAM. And so we don't get too confused but have them hitting each other. We're going to deal with them separately to begin with. And here I've got uh, Peter Westlake, NPA, long-time school board member. I, I was on at 72, kicked off at 74, went on again in 76. And they expect to be kicked off in 78. Well, you never know. There's some people like And that. Frida Price, who is one of the founders of GEM, which has been swallowed up by NPA, right? Well, not swallowed up entirely. Not swallowed We're up collaborating. entirely. You on the board at the moment? No. 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 Did you get close the last time? Fairly close. We did pretty well, but I wasn't running the last time. I ran in 74. I Make your case. You have a team-dominated school board at the moment, right? Yes. Make your case against them and why the rascals should be pitched out on their ears. Two reasons. First of all, they haven't been uh, financially astute, uh, as your uh, figures show. Secondly, they haven't taken much interest in the concept of education in the basic sense of the word. In other words, that we're spending a great deal of money and our children not as well educated as they should be. Right, and your reasons, if you can add uh, some. I'm, I'm mostly concerned uh, with the standards, which I suspect are not very good for uh, the expenditure of such a large amount of money. I would like to see a more structured, uh, structured approach. I would like to see more basic, uh, basic subjects uh, taught more at the same level in elementary school. In fact, I would like... Uh, I would like examinations to make sure what we're buying for this enormous amount of money. Let's forget about the esoteric cultural sides of education and talk about money. I am one of those simple-minded people who are very depressed by the figures. Yes. That the students are down in ten, nine years, 17,500, and the costs have gone from 628 per head to 2,100. Right. But surely, inflation must be account for a large part of that phenomenal well, from increase. From 70 to uh, 78, I'm told that inflation is 81 percent. And as you s showed on your screen, costs went up 2.5 percent. So we... 2.5 uh, percent? Well, just the major cost, but yes, 246 percent, 2.5 percent, 2.5 times. Uh, what has happened is that nobody has ever thought it necessary to save money. And uh, uh, it wasn't until people like you and, and uh, other citizens squawked that anybody started looking at costs. We have more principals than we had before. We have more permanent vice principals. We have more people in head office than we had before. Everything is bigger and better. The only thing we don't have more of is students. Now, I want you to concentrate, to zero in on that particularly. Students are down 17,500. Yes. If you had your way, 
uh, with an NPA dominated board, how many students would you, f how many teachers would you fire? How many vice principals would you remove? Well, um, uh, what, sorry. Uh, I would, uh, I would like to get rid of the psychologists out of the, out of the school system altogether. And I'm backed up by a recent report on teacher training at UBC, uh, chaired by Malcolm McGregor. And they say uh, that they believe uh, that uh, 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 counselors should uh, uh, never, uh, should not be expected to counsel children uh, who are psychologically disturbed. How many psychologists do we have in the school board? Fifteen, and I believe it costs 350,000 a year. Oh, that's 15 psychologists down the tube. Yes. What about the... the, the supernumerary teachers of what you tell me is true. Well, we, what we have to do is take about 10% off our administrative uh, at head office. So that, that, that can be done. Uh, for example, well, at Nathan, the jobs have to go, not the people. Uh, you understand? No, it, I don't it, understand. Well, we don't, we're going to have to do without an assistant secretary treasurer. We may not have to, to do with them out, without the man that's there now. He happens to be very competent, but we have to do without that job. We have to start getting rid of area superintendents, not necessarily get rid of those men, because they're good men. What we have to do is shrink the administrative head. We've got to have less principals and less vice principals. We not get rid of them. They are teachers and good teachers. Indeed, the only way we uh, promote good teachers is take them out in the classroom and make them administrators, which is patently ridiculous. This has to be done slowly and should have been done five years ago or six years ago when the problem became apparent that we were getting less children. Are you suggesting, for instance, that the team-dominated council is afraid of the teachers and afraid of the VCTF? I'm not suggesting that they're afraid of anything. What I am suggesting is they could care less. They've done absolutely nothing about this problem because it but needs to be planned. Frida and uh, <coughs> Mr. Westlake, if you cut the number of teachers, this dreadful thing of the pupil-teacher ratio will rise. Well, it, we think that perhaps classroom size is the more important factor and that if we take people who have certificates and make them teach, we're now 19 to 1, we would get the class size down. And that's what the much more important. In any case, it's when you run out of steam engines, you haven't any use for farming, and we don't have any children. It's very sad, but we've got to deal with that. Team, I know, is going to dump 146 teachers in 79. Is that, does that meet with your approval, or is that not nearly enough? Well, again, uh, the last... Well, half I'm sorry. of it they hope to do by attrition, they say. Well, yeah. uh, but really, the school system, what does it exist for? Not to supply employment to teachers, but it really uh, exists for the children. But it is a very difficult problem if the enrollment is going down. Uh, but if uh, teachers who've been tempted upwards into administration could be returned to the classroom, I think the whole system would benefit. I have nothing, yes. nothing I can... Uh, One important thing, Jack. It, teachers are employees of these local boards. According to the ministers, about 2,000 teaching jobs opening up in the province every year. What we've got to do is have, a, have a, a, a sort of employment exchange so that when a teacher becomes redundant in an area like Vancouver, that he's a, a job opens up in, in a place like Langley, it's growing. This question of throwing out people right, left and centre needn't be done that way. Yeah, but you are making the point, and I don't want to misrepresent yes. you. One of the main blankets of Teams Platform is that under other administrations, teachers and the system has become feather bedded to the extreme, hence the incredible rise in cost it, way above it inflation. It speaks for itself, doesn't it? Yes, but why did team engage so many teachers when the uh, uh, enrollment has been falling since 1972? I don't know, but we're going to ask them. Yes. You've just seen Frida Price and Peter Westlake, and one of them will be back later to field your telephone calls. Next, we're going to have some two candidates here from COP. <laughs> Almost did. Almost. Yeah, very close. Because yeah. while well, he'd be a colorful, useful establishment, kind of, yeah. <laughs> right. Oh yeah. Quite ironically, yeah. right. Yeah. The committee of progressive electors is making its big push this year, and it seems to become more kind of uh, what's the word? It's square, <laughs> establishment every time. And I have two people here this morning, and I'm going to deal with them individually to begin with. Wes Knapp. 
How many times have you run for school board? This is my first time. What do you do for a living? I work for the BC Teachers Federation. You gotta be joking. No, I work for the Federation in the area of professional development, uh, in service with teachers, coordinating a task force on race relations. You are a staff member of the BC Teachers Federation and you have the goal to run for school board? The goal? No, Jack. It's, uh, I'm a citizen of Vancouver. I have a very sincere interest in what's happening in Vancouver schools. The Teachers Federation doesn't run the schools. There's the Public Schools Act. I'm quite capable Basic of working. Basic conflict of interest. No, no. Your I'm... whole job is to help and, and protect the school teacher, member of BCTF. The Federation has a very strong interest in trying to improve our schools. That's right. And, and I share that interest. And if that is a conflict of interest, then uh, I welcome the charge because I think that the 60,000 students in Vancouver schools will benefit. There is no uh, legal bar to a teacher running for, you are a teacher too. A, a former teacher. A right. former teacher. I don't like to see these school boards run with teachers wives and whatnot like Burnaby used to be. They all seem to be related to teaching pretty mm -hmm. directly, didn't they? Well, I think it, they, they reflect the community. I don't think I'd want a board made up of nine teachers. It's not a concerted campaign to take over the school boards on behalf of teachers, is it? Oh, no, no. Well, I hope not. Connie Fogel, may I ask you what you do? Yes, right now I am a student at law. I'm in my last year. I have also a teaching background, and I have eight years teaching experience. Okay, why? What is COPE's policy, and where does it differ from team or... Uh, the old right-wingers okay. of well, GMNPA. Basic, basically, our position is that we put the children first. Um, we recognize the kinds of concerns that people have about cost. We say they're not uh, exclusive. We say the cost is not excessive. We say that it's um, the most important program and delivery of services that exists uh, for our people. We're talking about our own, our nation's future, and we're talking about the future of individual people. And we say we've got to, we have a trust to preserve, to ensure that we have a, a society that's that's productive and uh, and good. And in favor of motherhood, too. No, motherhood, I don't, I don't Can you be more specific? Because listening to Connie, I feel, oh my God, if Connie gets in, uh, she couldn't care less about the dropping number of students and the non-dropping in the number of teachers <laughs> and the feather bedding in the administration, which I think is widely accepted, is correct. Mm -hmm. Well, take the one issue of declining enrollment, Jack. Right. Declining enrollment really isn't a problem, as I see it, and as COPE views it, it's declining trust in the school system that is our main problem. I agree with you on that. The, the, the schools are losing the confidence of the public, and, and we, we think that we can reverse that, that, that we can instill greater confidence in what our schools are doing. What about the cost? The costs are certainly a very important factor. I mean, these figures I flashed up at the beginning are horrifying to the average taxpayer. Yes, but as you pointed out, and as uh, Peter Westlake pointed out, inflation accounted for a good 81 portion. 81%, that went up, but the costs went up 246%. Well, we're dealing with a different group of students today than ever before. You mean they need more cosseting, more coddling, and more individual training? They need more attention, right. Remember, our students today, all the students in school are going to spend most of their lives in the 21st century. To grade, today's grade one students graduate in the year 1990. Do you That's suggest an any economies of giving the students all they want and looking after the pupil in the classroom? Is there not a great waste? Though I remember recently they reduced the number of pupils in elementary schools for which they could qualify for vice principals. I think it came down from 450 to 350, mm -hmm. or 400 to 350. And I felt that was just a device to employ vice principals. Was I not correct? Well, it, it's, it's a Looks it's, like it. It, it, it uh, has that appearance, but again, it's that emphasis upon numbers. You know, I think that's uh, the abstract formulas is something that we're very much opposed to. You therefore have faith in the Vancouver School Board administration as it presently is set up? The administration as it's set up. Well, look, at Jack, when you're... Costs. I'm back to money. Yeah, back to money, of course. You know, but I think it's a red herring that people do to basic services to throw in the point that everything is just too expensive. I mean, if you break that down to the individual person, we're talking about $10 per child per day. We're talking about a dollar one per person throughout the, uh, throughout the province of, Brand, uh, of British Columbia. The other $10 per day is, uh, is within Vancouver. I mean, Jack, that is not a lot of money. That is not excessive. You can't even get a babysitter to take care of your child in one day, anywhere near that kind of money. We're talking about putting our children with people and trusting uh, to our children, to people, we want to make sure that they're going to be getting 
a proper kind of service. You know, it's just not right to say that, that we're dealing with something that's too expensive. In other words, we shouldn't count the cost. We should supply whatever is necessary to the educational system. Whatever is necessary. Now, I wanted to pick up on something you said a minute ago because you said, are we going to uh, give to the children all that they want? You know, that sort of implies that we're, we're mollycoddling the children and we're, <clears throat> we're, we're patting them on the back and we're giving in to them. We're not at all doing that kind of thing. We are providing. I mean, if you go into a classroom, you'll see the kinds you of things that's going on in there. You should be running for team. No, no. Look, we have some progressive people running with team. Don't, you know, don't sell them that short. They have done some good things. There are some good programs that are functioning in this school system right now. What we are faced with is trying to protect the good programs. Look, the provincial government is, has dumped into the school board system all those handicapped children. They've dumped them into the system without backing up. Uh, the, the, the kind of cost support that is absolutely crucial. Now, it's unfair to the children, unfair to the, to the teachers, just to put those kids in there. You're talking about a situation... You're talking about mainstreaming I'm handicap. I'm talking about mainstreaming Well, handicap. social credit used that as a device to cut their costs at Jericho and have dumped it on the backs of the school boards. Although, philosophically, it's desirable to put some handicapped children in the mainstream and not make them freaks on the outside. When they're ready. That's when right. they're ready. Oh, and right. that used to be the but practice. One of the problems that's gone wrong with the whole thing is that the appropriate placement of students has been lost. The, 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 it's a very sensible type of, it's a very attractive policy to mainstream children to educate them as but close the, to their home as possible. The government won't give the school board the money for the extra. That's right. That's right. Although many of us feel the Vancouver school board's got all kind of money that it's wasting now. Look, you could, you could begin to use some of the teachers if there's going to be any excess to retrain them to deal with that. Right now what's happening is people, citizens, volunteer people are coming in from the community with no training and their hearts are just breaking for some of these kids. We had a call when we were on uh, the Reynolds program from a woman who was acting Enough as a volunteer person. Enough of that. My person. time is up. We'll come back to that later. <laughs> Nap, either Nap or Fogel, they can pick. We'll be back for the telephone calls. Tell me. That okay, would you call me when you finished at Southland Riding Club? Where you're giving out the $10,000 check? My voice is on the air now, Mr. Attorney General. Yours is not. Please call me later. Bye. A uh, little chat with the Attorney General. <laughs> Tell you about it later in the program about the public hearing or not for the judge who is under an allegation and who's going to be dealt with. And what at the present moment is a secret meeting of the BC Judicial Council. Somewhere, sometime, perhaps tomorrow, somewhere in Vancouver. Perhaps in some basement suite. I don't know. Nobody will say. Excuse the interruction. No, it's quite all right. Uh, <laughs> Betty Ann Fenwick. Good one of the team establishment. Former chairman of the Vancouver School Board. I am the chairman Still now. the chairman. It takes a whole year. <laughs> uh, Jack Bush. On... School board now? No. Not no. now. First time. Okay, you are under attack. Yes. More or less as... Uh, Obviously. <laughs> as extravagant slobs who throw away the public's money. How do you defend yourselves? Well, first of all, we're, on, on the one hand, we're being told that, that uh, we are we're extravagant. We're not fiscally responsible. From the other side, we're saying that we're, we're not uh, giving enough programs. So I think that, that uh, we're going to defend ourselves by saying that we're, we're trying this year to maintain the quality and, of education without uh, increasing costs. I'll tell you what and my I research shows here this morning. <laughs> Just listen to this and please respond, each of you. Team oh. has had a majority on the board for the last six years. Yes, true or false? It's true. Basic cost in that time has gone up by $50 million. Well, I haven't got my, I can't You'll add as fast figures. as that. I'll accept your figures. Enrollment is down by thousands. Well, yes. In the six years, it's down 9,000. Okay. Seven more principals have been added. 20 more permanent vice principals have been added. Head office staff has been increased by 30. During no, the last two I, years, 130 I, I teachers have been that. hired. All right. I, uh, we, I, I will accept the fact that we have decreased the pupil-teacher ratio in f over six years. When I came on the board, it, the pupil-teacher ratio was 23.5. This September, it is 19. Now, point when one. You, what is the relation to classroom size between the pupil-teacher right. ratio and classroom size? Our class, uh, if, if you say the pupil-teacher ratio 
uh, at 19.1 are elementary primary class sizes. At this moment, we're trying, we're holding at 24 children. In other words, that 19.1 pupil teacher ratio is a phony. Well, it's a, it's a way of... It of counts all the teachers who are not teaching. It counts everyone who is in a school holding a teaching certificate. In other words, Whether they enroll a class or not. But we have in our schools uh, librarians. Now, they are 100%, they could be 100% librarians. They don't enroll a class. So they count, but, th but they are a necessary factor to that school. All right, how long can you continue to hire teachers, Jack Bush, when the enrollment has dropped so sharply and suddenly and you've got empty classrooms and in some areas around here they have closed schools? How many have you closed? We have, have closed two annexes. Two annexes. How long can you continue with this incredible disparity between the number of students and the permanent teaching force? Well, Jack, we're not going to hire more teachers, so that is a fallacy. We're not hiring more teachers. As a matter of fact, we're going to have to face up this year to um, a reduction in the number of teachers. We don't know what that's going to be, but we do know that over 90 teachers are going to be taken care of by attrition. And what we're... Index pensions. No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Some of them just leave to have that's right. children. <laughs> uh, or, uh, or, uh, for, or for other reasons. So we're not hiring more teachers, to answer your question. And we can't go on hiring more teachers, obviously, because with declining enrollment, you just don't need teachers because you don't have the children to teach. But you're no. too little, too late. You should have no. started doing that years ago. Well, no, we, we did uh, we start this sometime ago. We about. don't think we're too little, too late. We think that we've made some good moves this year. First of all, for the, it, up until this year, we have been working, consciously working, to decrease that pupil-teacher ratio because it, we felt with, with the urban population in Vancouver, with the, with the type of, of, of city we have, we need small class sizes, and we have consciously worked to that. This year, we, we have brought in a, a cost-saving administrative proposal. The board has brought that in this year that will, with as enrollment declines, and this is just at administration level, all through the system, talking from our area superintendents right down, as the enrollment declines, we are going to save $3 million in administrative costs. And in future. Over a period of I five question. years. Do we have any cross-city or cross-province or cross-grade examinations on the system? We have no cross city. How can you have a, a school system we have with standards? A, we have a great many examinations that go on within schools, and and uh, as far as project build is concerned, that that's the basis of it. What was examinations within the schools? We don't like to compare school A with school B because they have they have different clientele they should have the same standards we hopefully Listen, if we will get there someday project build we have 40 was percent your duplication of, yeah. of the provincial no program. way how much did it cost project build when it is complete will have caught will have the cost will be a million and that was where you're going to teach the teachers how to teach English, we, isn't and it, that right? And it's working why did you have to teach the teachers how to because teach because the university didn't do it the University of BC and SFU the teachers, failed. The teachers training institutions assumed that because if you were English, you could teach English. So one of the difficulties we have in school is that the teachers don't know how to teach well, English. Well, in Vancouver, a great many of them do know now. Because and we, and we have a core, that's right, that's right, and we have a core curriculum now in the language in development. English. That's right. Core curriculum in English. Great stuff. Language development. Can not anybody just spell in yet? There a lot of spelling going on. I, I went to school in Vancouver uh, a, a quite a long time Spell ago. Spell succinct. I couldn't. Spell succinct. I couldn't. Spell I succinct. Really, no, I won't. Break. Back <laughs> with the candidates for your phone calls. You're terrible. I Not there, please. Oh, oh what a rotten thing to do. Vandalism in the schools cost $610,000 last year. <laughs> Where am I going, Linda? Eins, zwei, drei, vier, fünf, six, up the line. Look at the lights. Good gracious, Jack. Look at the lights? Cool. Instant response. Oh, good. Mm. Okay. Have a hard time 
won't get them all on. We won't get, we won't them, get them all on. Do we have to answer questions? I'm on the air. Oh, oh, nobody told me. I'm very sorry. The guests with me now, not guests, political candidates are not guests. No. Benny Ann Fenwick of Team. Connie Fog Fogel, F E O G A L of F O G A L. That's what I said, F O G A L. <laughs> Smart Alec. My name's Westlake. Of Cope and Peter Westlake of uh, NPA Jam. Go ahead, please. It appears to me that the present school system that we have is rather deleterious to both the gifted child and the less able one. And there seems to be an unnecessary duplication because. The school, it seems, is homogeneous, and we should resort or give consideration to um, having schools for the bright. Okay, here's a guy who wants to stream the schools in a class way. Uh, does any of you have a response to that? That's not streaming in a class way, Jack. That's, that, that's Academic classes. Well, th those are needs that do have to be dealt with, and it's, it, he's, he's right to some extent. There's no question about that. Uh, the problem is, of course, is how are you going to deal with it? Right now, this whole program, we've been talking about cutting costs, and basically what it does boil down to is cutting services. And those are the very kinds of needs that are not going to no, be able to deal with. No, that's rubbish. Rubbish. We don't spend half enough time on the bright show, and they're the most important kids that are going to produce the most when they're adults, and he's absolutely right. It's a public school system. We're talking about an every man's child has a right to education. I agree with you for There's the first time in my life. Thank you. Go ahead, please. Hello. Yes. Yeah, I was just wondering, I was listening to the program, why they aren't progressing. If they can't keep the children in line now and they're the citizens of the future, why not progress with progress and use computers? Television? No, thank you, sir. Your call is not comprehensible. Go ahead, please. Oh, uh, I'd like to uh, address the chairwoman, please. Yes, here she is. Carry on. I have a niece who's a school teacher. Her husband is a school teacher. They've got a combined take-home salary of $37,400 a year. And uh, they are quite, uh, oh, quite open about the maximum hours per day that they work, which is the maximum is five and a half hours a day, which may be twice a week. Now, if that's not feather bedding, what do you say to that, Betty Ann Fenwick? Be pardon? What does Betty Ann Fenwick of Tim say to that? Uh, I would, I would hope that the majority of our school teachers in the Vancouver system work at at least five and a half hours a day. And as far as a man and wife working, I I believe that a, a woman has as much right to if her profession what's, is school teaching. What's as the minimum? A five man. and a half hours a day. I said yeah. I hope that. I that is that the the the, max, the minimum that they must work? I said a maximum of five and a half. Look at Jack. I've been a school teacher, and I know that you spend a lot more than five and a half hours a day. And you know, you cannot look. At, you're on this program a certain length of time, and and Don't that's not the me, that's I'm not the total package of yes. time that that is I that goes into production. But of but well, the same thing goes for teachers. You can't you can't get in and do your production but in every, only on the time yeah. that yeah. you've got to do. do. Yeah. In every no, profession, that's not true. in every profession, there are people that slack off. If we tested the quality of the children coming out of that classroom and a teacher was found wanting, then we deal with it. But the present time, you can get away with anything in the system. No, that's, that's not true. Not that's true. true. That's why Next we Next call. Have Go ahead, please. Yes, I would like to ask, um, last week in Surrey, there was, uh, quote, a riot where the... <laughs> oh, yes, there was a riot in school. That's yeah. not a Vancouver problem, but that, you're talking about the riot in school where the, the principal attempted to impose some discipline Smoking, yes, on yes, girls yes, going yes. to the washroom where the fixtures were being... <laughs> torn to pieces and the place was left in a mess. Now, to bring it to Vancouver, which is only fair, okay. last year vandalism cost $610,000. Done mostly by the students, well, Mary Ann Fenwick? Well, the, the included in that cost is the cost of material to repair the Well, vandalism. of course it is. And the material costs keep going up. I don't know if it was done mostly by the students. What about discipline in know. schools, Peter Westlake? We have the, good the, discipline. the discipline in school is better than it was, but there's going to have to be more control exercised. Look, when you're talking about vandalism, you're talking about a social problem that doesn't begin and end in the school. You're talking about needing to have some things for the children to do after school hours, mm. part of which the school can be involved in. How many you're, years have we been no, doing that? Come on now. Come 
Oh, how many there years? are all sorts of how children who have nothing to do after so school So they go out and smash it's windows. A, it's, it, no, it's a social system. It's a social problem. It's not a school problem. It's the total package that we've got to look at. Discipline right? is not part of the social oh, system. Discipline is, but what are you talking about? Discipline in the well, schools? What do you mean by discipline? Strapping children? Not I mean, how is that going to t train people all to right. be human? Discipline what attendance? in the home. What is the compulsion on attendance in grades 11 and 12? What compulsion is it on attendance in Vancouver High Schools? Wait, as a matter of fact, in the Vancouver yeah. high schools, we maintain a higher pupil, a higher number of pupils what is the than number? any other school district. What is the number? Oh, 93 percent. No, but how many don't attend classes? Very few. I just Peter? told you. We don't know the number because attendance, proper attendance records are not kept That's in the not higher grades. That's true. They are kept. There's, and a Peter. child doesn't have to be in a school. You know, exactly. What are you I, talking about? You're talking I, about trying to force children to pay yes, to stay into school. Yeah. You're talking about 1,600 kids last year who dropped out. Now, that's no. a pretty devastating kind of comment on our system when we've got kids. You know, the school system, the major function of it has been to keep kids off of the job market. It's one of the things that, ha that, has, that has been going on. We've got to be keeping the kids in school, and in order to do that, we've got to be able to meet their needs. Hold your breath. Go ahead, please. Yes. Um, uh, read that last topic of uh, discipline. I would like to see the, uh, the school system crack down on the discipline in the schools, especially at the junior high level. Okay, sir, we'll leave it at that. We'll we don't have that any excitement. junior highs in Vancouver. But you have problems with discipline, that I know. Go do ahead, you? please. Yes. How do you know that? Jack, that little gallon. Hold on, please. Go ahead, please. Oops. Go ahead, please. Go ahead, please. Good morning. Good morning. Um, First of all, I would like to say that I do not object to the amount of money I spend in taxes for schooling for my children or for anyone else's children, Mr. Webster. Good. But what I do object to is the caliber of some of the teachers that we are having in this decade, this generation. I think that we have to go back to the old system of where children had a respect for their teachers, where they felt that they could look up to them and if they needed advice, could go to them and get the advice they wanted. Not the type of teacher that smokes pot on the side. The kids are aware of it. They know that they're living with someone else. They know that the teachers aren't married. They don't have any basic respect. Well, now, not all teachers fall into that category, let me hasten to add, but there have been complaints of that many times over many years. Is that not correct, Betty Ann I, Fenwick? I have heard complaints of, of it. You never look into them, but you've heard complaints of Oh, now, of look, Jack, it, it, what, a, what a teacher does on their own time is not my business. Oh, and there's a very good point. If a teacher is convicted of uh, possession of pot... Convicted. Conv oh, don't go into the <laughs> sickening business of, of the acquittals or... Well, or, that, that's uh, unfortunately that, that's what happened. I'm asking you specifically. I, if a teacher is convicted of possession of pot in the criminal court and not given an absolute or conditional discharge, should he be allowed to teach in the system? No. No. You. No. no. You. Yes. He should be allowed to teach in the system. We, we're looking, if he's convicted. You know, we're looking at a situation um, that's um, uh, an attitude that's reflected in the uh, across the country of changing the situation with regard to marriage. Connie, marijuana. don't yes, give me that. Look I at, asked you a specific no, question. No. Please answer it again. I answered it. If, if a teacher if is convicted of, of a pot <laughs> offense, criminal and offense, a criminal offense involving marijuana, should he be fired, yes or no? No. Cope is in favor of pot smoking teachers. No, Cope is not in favor sounds of pot like smoking it. teachers. Sounds like it. Certainly sounds no. like it to me. No. Doesn't it sound like I'm it to you? She's waffling. A, a a person, no, I'm not waffling. She's not waffling. No, Just a, give me the old grassroots social the problem. The Public bit. Schools Act s it says that a teacher with a criminal conviction. McGee was dead a, right in that. No, but the, no, he, he, he was right in that he, in he the had public no guts, school but act. He was right in his attitude. The, 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 there is a serious. The thing is, the, the judge Vancouver didn't right. convict case. that one. No, no, no. The yes, West, West Bank. The West Bank. Don't talk about it. Something else again. Yes. Except, except, a break, please. Yeah, no. it, the problem that. Is, how do you
Perian Fenwick from Team, yes. Connie Fogel from Cope, and Peter Westlake from Gem NPA. Go ahead, please. Uh, yes, I have uh, two questions and one comment. Uh, the fact that there are very few textbooks in the school system and all these mimeograph sheets, I don't understand how they expect the students to have anything to refer to when they need any help with their homework. And I've never seen any Canadian textbooks. Is this a new trend? They yes. We're spending more on, on putting books in libraries in the school system than the Vancouver Public Library is in the whole system. It's 800,000 in the budget this year, so I don't know where that lady, maybe she's right, maybe the books are being stacked up, but we got the impression that we're buying them and they were using them. Well, What's your next question? Okay, um, then uh, with the Canadian text companies, we immigrated from the States, and all the books our children are using are all the same damn books they had down there. <laughs> yeah, well, I agree with that, that, that there should be more Betty Canadian Ann Fenwick, content. We shouted Just about this on yes. the air ten years ago, and you haven't done a well, dash we thing. We don't have a lot. It's not up to the school board to do it. We don't have a large enough market to, g to get the publishers to, to uh, do Canadian books, and that's We're just an American problems. colony anyway. We exactly. accept well, these things. Yeah, I would hope that we're going to grow up. <laughs> that must be a mistake. Go good. ahead, please. Yes, is there any difference between the school system um, uh, between Vancouver and the lower Fraser Valley? Not basically. Well, each school board is autonomous and has their own their own uh, uh, way of doing things. Uh, Vancouver is the largest school system in British Columbia, so the size makes a difference to different to our our. Why thing. would you ask that question? Yeah. Well, uh, this is, I've I've heard a lot of people say that that uh, Vancouver children, especially elementary children, are taught different compared to the Lower Fraser Valley. I'm sure that's right, because 40% of the children are elementary school or immigrant children. But as a matter of fact, every school is different. There are no standards at all. What's going on in Prince Rupert is entirely different than what's going on in Quinell and what's going on in Vancouver. What about schools? this core curriculum? curriculum? There is, that's correct. Oh, there, are, blind, there are no standards. And Nonsense. Well, <laughs> I don't think the minister thinks so. There are no nonsense. examinations as such. Yeah, there are all kinds of examinations. Are there any tests? citywide tests? You no. can't no. have citywide tests. Why not? Because you've got in the in especially a city like Vancouver, you've got so very different kinds of people in the air. Just a minute now, Peter. It's got an awful lot. It's got everything to do with it. Different because standards for no, different no, no, ethnic no, no, not at all. No, no, listen. It's, listen. it's a racist it's remark. Not a racist it's, here, here. it's racist in the sense that we have to recognize the race differences, and there are very many children coming into our schools who don't speak English at all, and we've got to be able to and deal with And who are the best students? Yes, it doesn't right. Chinese. At racist. mathematics. Why? At mathematics. Because, because they have a sense of work and discipline. Good. There's nothing wrong with work and discipline. Chinese Canadian standards Listen, for we've, all of We've got to make sure that <laughs> right. we do meet right. the, the different needs that are out there in all the places, and you can't possibly have uh, those standardized kinds of tests. And it's wrong Why to say testing. It's wrong to say stand that testing well, is not good. Well, I goes on all the time. Not to put all the immigrant children through to the same standards as the wasps. Well, okay, it's not just that we minute, want the same Jack. standards. We want them to reach the same yes. level. But we have to do it in a different way. That's why the tests can't be identical. What does the grading mean? If you've got a C in one There's school and a C in another has no meaning at all, the child's being cheated because not it's not talking being about competition. Well, because between the, a, child a child in one, talking about the child a child in one school is getting less of an education than another because we're that not is, watching the standards between the schools. It's absolutely I agree with shocking. You, Peter. Test, shocking. Testing doesn't mean that the standards remain the does. same. Teacher, we had control. testing in Vancouver, and do you know what happened many years when I went to school in Vancouver, and even after that, I can tell you some horror stories. The tests that were given across the city of Vancouver were given Friday morning in every elementary school, and they were shipped out from the school board office, and the principal delivered them to all the classrooms and that it got it got it. to be but that's, that's what, what happened about, it's, yeah. it's sure it the is. misuse of the test exactly. that's wrong well your system's been rotten for years longer There's than we thought work. it was <laughs> yeah, yeah. Listen, it's, it's good, better, it's better now. the way it is now it's got to be improved <laughs> go ahead please okay um i would like to address the panel and ask a couple of questions please do uh, pardon please do okay number one um i would like to know whether the panel finds that the um, average Canadian children are much more intelligent than they used to be. Yes or no? Yes or no? I would think they're much more aware because they have... What they it have used to be? 1867? Yes, they're more intelligent than Impossible to answer that question, ma'am. Okay, well, the reason I answer is because of all the television and all the... Yeah, uh, what is it? The, um, uh, yeah, so, the, so their, Engli their English is worse yeah, than it was. In that. Yeah. The other question that I have is... Um, you were talking about the dropouts and everything else. Um, I have talked to a lot of young people, 
majority of the reason for dropout is because they are bored at school. I believe that to be true, don't you? We, that, poor that teaching is, that standards, is, no, lack of not, discipline? No, it's not poor teaching standards. It, public, education isn't for every child at, at a particular time. And some children do drop out or leave, but the thing is to have a then place for them to enter back also. Well, we don't have a high rate of dropouts. If you'd heard no, what I said before, well, yeah. we, we managed to hold more of our senior students in high school than any other school district but in the But you province. say right now, but Betty Ann Fenwick, let them drop out them. when they want to and come provided, back when they feel like no, it. No, provided that there is. Look, at, I can give you an example of two children children that, that are fairly close to me that left school at the end of grade 11. One of them is out working mm, and, the, and the other one has gone to, to the college to take the, the course yeah. at King Ed. Yeah. If those kind of things are available to them, maybe that's better if, if for Okay, them. just to sum up, please. Right. Oh, we've one more break. I'll, eat, I'll give you each a minute to make a pitch at the end, right? Right now we're going to take a break. Make some money. Okay, so you got seven minutes in this segment. I was a good little editor. Perhaps more heat than light this morning, but the fact remains that you see the faces of the people for whom you may decide not to vote. Thank you. Go ahead, please. From, I think it's Lake Cowichan, but do come into Vancouver on this topic. Oh yeah, well, in, in, in regards to that uh, respect and discipline thing, you know, I was just I was just in school uh, a couple three years ago there, and some teachers there you could go to their class, and they had, they had no problem handling 40 kids. They could handle 40 kids with ease, and, and everybody was at attention and listening to what they say. And then you go to the next guy's class next period, and this guy either was stoned or he was drunk out of his head, and all the kids stepped. You mean stoned on pot? Attention. Do you mean stoned on pot? Yeah, stoned on pot, or if some of them stoned on alcohol, it's the same difference. Yeah. But alcohol, they're, they're not with it. So the kids are no way, are the kids ever going to, how are the kids going to respect this guy? How old are you now? Well, I'm 20. 20. You left school three years ago. Yeah, well, I, I quit when I was 17. Well, who did anything about the teacher whom you say was stoned? Nobody, I don't suppose. anything about them. That's what I mean. How in the hell, how, how, how can this system be any good if all these people are in the system? You, you know, know we think it's going on in places. Betty Ann Fenwick, Connie, Look at Peter. Yeah, that, kind of, that kind of conduct, absolutely, no question, is inexcusable. It should just, be fired. It, it, just, it just should not be allowed to, to exist. And if you but try to fire a teacher, it costs oh, you $150,000. Right. No, listen, Jack, I want to make this point. Oh. What we, we were talking about before about the marijuana, and I said what I said about that. The point is, you have have to compare it to impaired driving. These things, as individual people on their own time, they do that. Uh, that's a moral kind of judgment that people are going to make about whether or not those people should be convicted. That's something that, uh, and and fired. That's something that's separate and distinct from what this boy is talking about. No, no. Clearly, you can't have somebody functioning in a school system and doing something that's that's immoral like that. You cannot do All that. Right. He's dealing directly with drunk. the kids. Let's, let's say half of one percent. Let's say ninety-five percent of the teachers are perfect. Put in a ten-hour right. day, love their job, and all the rest of it. Have you ever tried to fire a teacher? How much does it cost? Well, no, we've let teachers go. 150,000 bucks. But we let teachers well, go who we've, wanted we've to go. We've been very good, very but fortunate in two. Vancouver because, because we have a, a well-structured system with a lot of administration on the, <laughs> that, <laughs> that looks after <laughs> these kind of problems. No, I'm not kidding. That, that's one, one of the Coombs reasons. Age to but deal we with. do, because a lot of our sure, teachers are counseled do out of it. No, and if, no, and, no, and no, if we so. had a teacher, if, if there was a teacher in a high school, and I'm sure there are some, that, that w was drinking, the principal would be responsible to see that that teacher was not there the Just next day. Just by the day. way, I must be equally unfair to people. Isn't your hu husband a school principal? No. What is he? He's a director of instruction in West Vancouver. Why? He's a... What's a director of instruction of what? Of the education system. Of West Vancouver. Vancouver. Isn't that a conflict of interest? You're yeah, on the school board? I don't think so. How can it be a conflict I, of interest? I mean, sure. surely he's a separate and distinct person from her. 
She's an individual. I, He's an individual. I would ban school teachers from running for a school board. I mean, well, I'm not a school too. teacher. You would ban though. lawyers from running uh, for the AG's department. I mean, from from, from holding that Matter kind of fact, position. Matter of fact, the AG's department was vastly improved if they uh, took all the lawyers out come of it. Come on, come on. Are you talking about, you know, that's silly. You're talking about people having a basic interest and an expertise. And there's nothing wrong with being able to deliver that service. Sometimes and what I you think do it's is a make sure that anytime there's a conflict the of interest, you you interest, you, you, you no, just it, Burnaby it, was no, a good example. Well, Burnaby is, is example. not Vancouver. Free teachers, you know. Free school teachers. What you have to look at is what's happening in the system, not, you know, with the particular occupations of the people that are there. You want people who are going to deliver the service and make no. sure that a trust goes Don't on. Don't want school insured. teachers on school boards, well, I'll tell you that. That's well, fine. That's your that's position. Your but that's your position. Not the position. But, that, but surely, you know, what my political life is has nothing to do with my husband. I mean, I might not even be living with him. Well, I would like to know. I wouldn't vote for you because your husband is a, you a school teacher. He's I would not, vote against you because of that. He's not a school teacher. A uh, director of instruction. You're splitting hairs. No, I, well, he was a school teacher many years ago. Where do you stand on it, Wesley? Well, Are you a reactionary like me? I've said in front of their associate, teacher associate, no teacher should be allowed to run for school board. But I can't say the same for spouse. That's going a bit far. All right, I withdraw that remark. Thank you okay, listen, much. Jack. Do you <laughs> refrain from voting for people on city council who are developers or are real estate yes. people or insurance people? <laughs> yes. Well, at least you're consistent. <laughs> well, not the wise. <laughs> well, right. Go ahead from Campbell. Kamloops, isn't it? Hello, Vancouver. Yes, my dear. Speak up, please. Hello, I was going to call for you from... Yes, I'll accept it. I'll accept it. Thank you. Oh, the wonders of technology. It's fine. <laughs> Gives us time to relax a little. Smart, smart. Go ahead, please. I give up on you. She's lost her Speak place. now or forever hold it's your peace. Small. You've lost it. Go ahead, please. You know, the school board is considering baby care centers in the high schools for girls who have babies so they can go on with their education. What is the candidate's reaction to this? And I'm going to hang up and... Thank you, ma'am. And you finish, we, you finish on an excellent note. Uh, what is there a babysitting service for high school children with their own proposed. babies, or is there plans for one? No, there there was a motion passed by the board to di for us to discuss with daycare, uh, the daycare association, if this would be feasible. We had, our report came to us saying that there were a lot of girls dropping out of school that that had babies and they weren't returning to school. But it's just a report. It's just a, in is the study. Is there a need for such? We don't a know. The the report said there was a oh, need. Come off it, Betty. You know how many girls had babies in school No, I last don't. Year. I really Why don't. Why don't you know? <laughs> if there is a need, perhaps it should yes, be met. Yes, it might be. It, it, this clearly is we'll another kind out. of example where you've got to have a cross-disciplinary kind of approach. You've got to have. You can't divorce education from all the other from the other aspects of our of our society. You have to have. A cooperation with the Ministry of Human Resources. You have to have cooperation at the at the element. At but the do you agree with me, just off the top of it? If you have 50 children with 50 babies, and right in the last couple of years of high school, mm -hmm. we should make some arrangement to look after them. Of course, you should. Well, do you agree too? Yes, but for all for all oh. adults who who want to finish their grade 12 education and have small children, we were asking the city or the province to fund a daycare so that they could come back to school, and that was all. That was all. That quite was a sane all. thing, not quite oh. shocking. We thought it was quite sane. It sounds quite sane, and even I would go. <laughs> along with that, and yeah. I'm the world's worst redneck, except for Doug Collins, of course, yes, of course. who is the champion of them all. You actually I have agree. got a redneck, too. Peter Westlake is from JMNPA, <laughs> Connie Fogel is from Cope, and Betty Ann Fenwick, whose husband is a teacher in West Vancouver, which you mustn't hold against her, <laughs> is uh, the chairman of the Vancouver School Board. There's lots of things to hold against An enjoyable joust. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, you very much, Jack. <laughs> Give me your pen back. At the start of the program this morning, I delivered myself of a very serious editorial when I was informed by the Associate Chief Judge of the Provincial Bench that there is going to be a meeting somewhere in Vancouver soon about this judge accused of uh, consorting or going into a taxi cab with a known prostitute. And I made the point that in my humble opinion, having been around a long while and know a little thing or two, that cases like this, the judge's conduct against which there are serious allegations, should be held in public. I spoke to the Attorney General during the program. He could not give me any decision. He thought it should be left up to BC Judicial Council. With respect, I think the Attorney General is wrong. Tomorrow, Linda.
We have four candidates for mayor tomorrow. The four minor candidates for mayor. Yeah. Can you yeah. name them in five seconds? Burgundy, Burgundy Besida, and Ingram. Good show. Tomorrow morning, the minor candidates for mayor should be good fun, 9 a.m. precisely.